So thank you all for joining the, the session. Uh, my name is Ron de Jong. I'm the uh, I'm a sales engineer at Black Duck by Synopsys now. Uh, this is actually the third year we're here. Uh, last year I did a presentation as well. And obviously things have changed a little bit as now we're part of the bigger Synopsys family. Um, so today I'm going to talk about open source supply chains and consumption risks um, with a bit of a focus on containerized applications and containers. Um, Quite a bit of what we will see today, uh, some of the, the data that we see in this presentation comes from uh, our OSRA report. OSRA stands for Open Source Security and Risk Analysis. So traditionally, uh, a big part of, of, of Black Duck uh, has been focusing on, on performing audits. So basically, when companies, software development companies, find themselves in an M&A kind of situation, they would come to us and we would audit their code base. We're still doing that a lot today. So as you can see, in 2017, we analyzed well over 1,100 code bases for, for customers coming from 500 different companies across 17 different in industries. Um, and based on that, we have a lot of information. We can actually see trends on how open source is consumed, what kind of risk is hidden in those code bases, and things like that. So that kind of information get pu gets published in our OSRA report. Um, the latest we have right now is, is, is the 2018 report, which was uh, published early this year. And it's based on 2017 data, as you can see. So the next one will be uh, published probably somewhere around February. Uh, but you can grab a copy, to a copy of this report today. It gives some pretty nice insights into uh, what kind of problems that the companies are typically facing with, when, uh, with their uh, uh, consumption of open source. Um, so a modern application. Uh, so modern application typically uh, uh, consists of a couple of components. Uh, obviously, there's proprietary code in there, so the, the, the code that your developers will be, will be working on, maintaining, basically to give your solution that, that uniqueness. Uh, next to that, you'll find typically a lot of, lot of open source in there, uh, and as we, if we, uh, uh, what the gardeners and the foresters of this world are saying is in line with what we find in, in, our, uh, in our own research, and that, that tells us that up to 90% of, uh, of an application can actually consist of open source components. Uh, nowadays, we're also consuming uh, uh, APIs, public API, APIs maybe, and there's also some quantity of application behavior and configuration. So like I said, nowadays we find ourselves in a situation where the, uh, the amount of open source is, has outgrown the, 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 the amount of proprietary code quite a bit. And this is nicely illustrated by a presentation that the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computer Foundation, did uh, and uh, in a presentation uh, which is called How Good Is Your Code? And this illustrates this quite nicely. So in there, they looked at uh, an interactive land landscape application the, that consists of 40K lines of code. <coughs> uh, it's primarily developed in, uh, well, its primary language is, uh, is Node.js. Obviously, this is uh, deployed in Kubernetes. And if you f solely focus on that, on, that, on, that, on that application, you would not necessarily be concerned with the things, uh, things like Spectre and Meltdown. But as soon as you start looking at the whole stack, which we see on the right here, then uh, you'll start to realize that there is quite a bit more that you may be concerned with. Uh, so that proprietary code, which only uh, is, is consists of 40k lines of code, makes use of third-party libraries, 2.5 million lines of code. Uh, there's no JS underneath there, 12.3 12 lines of code, a uh, million lines of code. Uh, obviously, there's Kubernetes underneath that, 35 million lines of code, and there's Linux, 17 million lines of code. So across that stack, there's a lot of potential risk that may be hidden in there that you need to quantify uh, and, 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 and deal with. So just only looking at that application may not give you a full, full visibility into the security risk that, is, uh, that may be hidden in there. So if you're, if you're interested, that, that, that presentation is a pretty nice, uh, uh, nice illustration of how, this, uh, how modern uh, uh, software application works. Um, so that basically means that risk mitigation has become a, co a governance task. So if you look at this from an open source usage perspect perspective, then um, uh, one of the things you, you, you uh, need to be concerned with is, is license compliance. Uh, and in order to get a proper picture of that, uh, you need to go beyond things like just uh, relying on, on, on package declared dependencies in package managers, for example. Um, so you need to basically find out all the dependencies that are used, what the associated licenses uh, are, and, and how that relates to how you're, well, potentially distributing that application. Um, next to that, there, there may be vulnerable components in there. Um, so you need to ask yourself questions like, okay, uh, am I using a direct, a direct dependency uh, from the main source, or am I maybe using a fork that someone is maintaining? If that's the case, how are they applying patches to that to those forks? Are they even, do, even doing that? Um, also things like, how is a component linked? Uh, 
am I actually including the, the, my dependencies myself, or am I making use of uh, dependencies provided by the operating, operating system? And that can make a difference from a security perspective, right? Because the, the, those may be different versions, may contain different security vulnerabilities. So um, how is patching managed, managed of the open source com components that you're using? Uh, obviously, across all the open source that's out there, this, is, this can vary wildly. Uh, from an operational perspective, um, th things that play a role there is, uh, well, uh, can you differentiate between, between things like a stable or a dead branch? Um, well, stable is probably a good thing, but a dead branch, if, if the, the maintainers of, the, or of that branch have moved on to work on something else, then, well, you may be on your own there, right? So you may have to adopt responsibility for that. Uh, and if you don't like that, then you may have some work ahead of you in the future to, to move back to the, to, to the main distribution. Uh, API versioning, how does that work? Uh, how long are API versions being maintained or supported? Uh, can they just go away? And what do I need to do with, uh, uh, with that? And again, security response process for the project can also can, can vary wildly. So this all ties into the operational risk. So basically, just something about the quality of a, project, uh, of a product. Um, from an API usage perspective, uh, what kind of data is passed, uh, being passed back and forth? Uh, is that acceptable from, uh, from, uh, from our company's perspective? Um, and, and also, uh, the, the, the use of APIs is typically bound to uh, specific terms, uh, terms and conditions. So, who owns that? Who, who keeps an eye on that? And um, can these kind of terms, terms and conditions change over time um, across versions of, or uh, things like that? So, all these kind of things need to be taken into account when you think about risk uh, uh, that may be hidden in the, the open source that you may be consuming. Um, if we zoom in a little bit on, on the, uh, the, the license compliance side of things, um, so open source licenses basically at a high level fall, fall, uh, fall into three, three categories. Uh, so there's permissive licenses, copyleft or reciprocal licenses, and then you have the, let's say, the uncertain licenses. So commercial companies have typically have, uh, have had a preference for, for permissive licenses, uh, typically because they're, they're designed to be compatible with not only other uh, open source licenses, but also with commercial licenses. So, um, you can typically freely use, copy, modify, distribute the, source, uh, the, the software without a whole lot of um, um, uh, obligations that may be hard to, to meet. And so, for example, there's never an, an obligation to distribute any derivative works that you may be creating from those components using those licenses. Um, that can be different with copyright or reciprocal licenses. Uh, and those are... The, the, the perception there typically is that if you use those and, and uh, uh, build code around that, that you, you, you may need to, to distribute that. Um, uh, also, your own proprietary code around that. Uh, obviously, there's a, more complex, a bit more complexity and nuance around that, but um, that is basically the main reason why a lot of companies are, 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 yeah, may have policies to stay away from these kind of reciprocal licenses. But of course, they do serve, serve a purpose because for one, uh, one party, it may be introducing risk from another, another, another par party, it may actually be uh, risk reduction. Um, for example, if you think about uh, this from a, from a security perspective, uh, if someone is using a open source component based on a permissive license and he finds a security vulnerability in there, decides to fix it, there's no obligation to deliver those fixes back to the community. Whereas with a copyleft reciprocal license, you may have that obligation. And then the last category here, uncertain licenses. Um, so that can be things like, uh, well, a certain type of licenses that may have, um, uh, yeah, may lack some jurisdictional definition based on uh, uh, geographical location, for example. So a, comp a concept like public domain, that's pretty well defined in certain countries, but not in all, right? So these kind of things can, make, can, uh, can play a role here. Also, you see a lot of um, a lot of open source out there. That's basically uh, where the maintainers basically didn't bother to uh, to uh, to uh, to pick a license for that component. So these kind of situations can render your application in an uncertain license state, and you should be aware of that. And that and, and basically make choices about uh, around that. So the key concept here is is a distribution. That's basically the trigger point under which certain uh, obligations need to be met. And um, I'm looking here at three, uh, th three types of usages, or th three types of dis distributions, basically. So if you're creating applications that you're only using internally, so basically distributing to your, to, to your employees, then that doesn't really trigger a, a, distribution, or a, a distribution here. Typically, a distribution is, is uh, defined by uh, a legal transfer of copyright. <coughs> um, also, 
most developers working for, for companies, they have a, a clause in their contract that says uh, uh, anything you create is, is, is owned by, uh, by the company you work for, right? So typically in those kind of situations, there's no distribution involved. So um, for internal applications, you can safely use, um, well, basically any type of, uh, of, 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 uh, of reciprocal license as well. That becomes a different story if you're talking about a group of, co of companies or when you're working with contractors or suppliers. So if you're outsourcing development to, let's say, the Far East, um, the, the, when, that, when that software, when those, let's say, those software components are being transferred back into you, that may trigger some, some obligations, right? Because that, that may see, be seen as a, as a distribution. Uh, and the GPL is also very clear about the fact that um, uh, there are some local or geographical uh, things that can play a role here. So uh, GPL does not and cannot override local laws. The interesting thing is, is that this is not ent entirely stable. Uh, IT uh, technology uh, evolves. So if we would have been talking about this, uh, let's say five years ago, then we would not have any, any um, uh, um, the, the, the concept of Docker or Docker push is not, well, wouldn't really be baked into, into processes. However, if you do a Docker push to Docker Hub, for example, then that is actually distribution, meaning that, you, uh, that all the underlying obligations need to be met. So the changes in technology can actually change the landscape here. That's basically the main message here. Um, so this, this, uh, here are some numbers that come from that OSWA report that I was, I was mentioning. So uh, actually 85% 85 of the code, ba 85 of the code bases, ba bases we've audited in 2017 had either uh, license conflicts or unknown licenses. And then 44% uh, of the audited code bases had GPL conflicts. So this is not, really not, 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 not a theoretical problem, this is actually a very practical problem, right? So. However, governance isn't just about managing IP. Um, so regulators, so uh, the, the guys that are sitting in Brussels uh, and, and are concerned about things like GDPR, uh, they're defining more and more uh, governance or around data, breach, uh, data breaches and data breach management. Um, and actually, uh, interestingly, Maria Korolov, uh, a writer for CSO magazine, wrote an interesting article early, um, early 2017 uh, how to get fired in 2017, have a security breach. And this was well a few months before the whole Equifax in incident. Um, then in that same year, about mid-year, uh, IBM together with the Panamon Institute published a, a study called the Cost of Data Breach Study. And this showed that the average cost of a data breach was 7.35 million. Uh, lost business, 4.03 million, and the average time to identify and contain a breach, 206 days. Um, I must make a note here because it clearly, stays, clearly says U.S. data there in the uh, uh, in, in the notes. Um, actually, well, if you if you look into the details here, you'll find that these numbers are uh, higher than average in the U.S. as well as the Middle East. Um, but uh, if, you, if you look at the global numbers, then the average cost of data breach is still uh, a bit over four million, so still a still a, a significant uh, uh, number. They redid this study in, in 2018, and uh, while I would love to say that things got better, actually they didn't. So the average cost of data breach went up by 0.6 million, uh, lost business up by 0.2 million, and the average time to identify and contain a breach went up by, uh, by 50 days, actually. <coughs> um, so yeah, this is clearly something that that, is, that, that a lot of companies are, are, are struggling with. Um, uh, so if, if there's one thing that Equifax did, that it, it, it did bring attention uh, squarely back on, on, on open source and the, and the risk, uh, risks uh, around that. So basically by one company, f company failing to, um, uh, to deal with Apache struts or the security vulnerabilities that were, uh, were, were hiding in there, um, yeah, led to all, these, all, this, all this press. Um, the unfortunate thing is that we now find ourselves, uh, ourselves in a situation where business leaders are questioning whether we should be consuming open source or not. Um, well, I think we can probably all agree that that's probably still a good thing to do, uh, but it didn't really help uh, these business leaders to understand how uh, open source gets consumed and how they should be consuming and defining processes around this, this in, their, uh, in, their, uh, uh, in their company. And that's partially because these business leaders typically live in a world where uh, they, they, uh, they know how, how uh, uh, vendor-supplied software works, right? So 
Uh, in those situations, um, so if you're talking about closed source commercial, commercial code, then there's typically a pretty strict traditional procurement process around this with all sorts of checks and, uh, and hoops you need to jump through. Uh, so it's a very conscious decision to start using a, a, a commercial com uh, a commercial uh, commercial software. Uh, this vendor typically has alerting and notification infrastructure in place, so they can notify you um, uh, when new new patches are available, when uh, there are security vulnerabilities that need to be taken care of. Um, so they have all this in place, basically. You can count on support being available through through end of life. They may have their own team of security researcher, researchers that are actively looking for uh, security vulnerabilities in, in, their, uh, in their code. And you can rely on uh, regular patch, patches to be available. And all this is supported by a dedicated support team with, with, SLA, with, with proper SLAs. Obviously, that's not the case with, with open source. Uh, the adoption model there is, is far more ad hoc. Um, so, and you may find yourself in, well, you typically find yourself into a, in a situation where you have to um, well, I think do things like actively monitoring new feeds, news feeds to to be up to uh, up to up to speed on on any um, uh, any risk that, that you may need to deal with. Uh, and end of life may carry the dead end. Uh, there's typically also no standard patching mechanism, so that also differ, differs widely across uh, open source that's out there. So basically, what it comes down to is that ultimately you are responsible. And just to illustrate what you would be what you may be dealing with, uh, this is a um, a media wiki, a media wiki uh, maintenance uh, uh, announcement. So in here it says various special pages resulted in fatal errors. Well, as a user of this component, this is not exactly very helpful, right? So wh what pages are we talking about? Um, does this really impact me? How do I find out? Um, so if you don't have a, not, an, an, a really intimate knowledge about how, uh, what media wiki is doing and how, it's, how, how it works for you, then um, yeah, you may have a hard time uh, analyzing this in, in your context. <clears throat> it also says, please note that the 124.6 marks the end of support for the 124.x series of rough releases. Technically, this ended a few weeks ago with a release of 126.0. However, 124.5 had issues along with other versions, so it was thought, thought fair to fix them. Well, that's all well and good. I mean, the, um, the community at least tries, well, the, the people behind this basically try to, to keep the community whole, which is good. But yeah, can I count on this behavior being repeated in the future? Um, also, there's no mention of the 123 version there, down there in the text. So, um, is 123 is, is that now also okay? Uh, are there any other versions that are, are okay to use? Um, so, this this may lead some some to quite some work to 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 properly analyze that and do a proper impact analysis. But this is what you may find yourself in, uh, and this is just one example of of a single single component component, right? So basically, open source vulnerability, vulnerability management is, is a challenge, and that is supported by, by our, uh, our own research, which clearly illustrates that. So what we found again in those, in those audits, 78% uh, of the code bases that we examined um, had at least one vulnerability, but the average was actually at 64. Now, you can argue that not all of them are uh, exploitable in the context of the application, but probably quite a few are. Um, then over 55% uh, of the vulnerabilities found in the audit, the code bases are considered high risk. Um, and on average, the vulnerabilities that were identified in the audits were, uh, well, had an age of about six years. So six years after the vulnerabilities were publicly disclosed, uh, they still haven't been dealt with properly. So again, this is a very, very real problem that a lot of, a lot of companies are, very, uh, are struggling with. And yeah, uh, our Osmo report, report illustrates that uh, quite well, actually. Um, so now you may be using uh, tools like uh, SAS, DAST, uh, interactive dynamic analysis, things like that, uh, which are definitely good tools to use. Um, however, they're not necessarily very good at finding vulnerabilities in, in, op in open source. So they typically find uh, common security patterns, um, but they are challenged by what, yeah, what's here called nuanced bugs, right? So, and actually, if I think that was actually down here, so. Our research team looked at, looked at this and actually found that most vulnerabilities were actually found by human researchers, not li by tools like this. So while they're very good at analyzing and finding problems in your own proprietary code, they are not specifically, specifically well targeted towards um, uh, letting you know what, what, what vulnerabilities may be hiding in, in open source. Uh, in order to do that, you, you need something uh, that, that Gardner and Forrester and, and uh, what's basically called in the industry uh, software composition analysis. So 
with that, you will be creating a full inventory of, of, of dependencies, again, beyond uh, just relying on things like declared uh, dependencies in, uh, through package managers. Uh, there, there are many ways in which open source can be brought in. Uh, for example, copy, just getting a, um, a component from GitHub, changing it, stripping it down, which is uh, very common in, in you know, better space still. Um, and of course, then, um, the, co the components that you're actually using need to be mapped to, to security information, to known vulnerabilities. And actually, this is not a very trivial task, because if you look at the, the, the CVEs as they are reported, reported in the NVD, um, then the way in which the, uh, these are described, the impacted versions are described, is not, not very, uh, very standardized. An initial challenge here is that the number of disclosures actually is going up pretty rapidly. So in back, in, back in 2015, 2016, three, 4,000. Um, but the, the beginning of this month, we actually uh, were already very uh, close to the, to the same level, uh, the same number of vulnerabilities uh, last year. So the rate is only, only increasing. Now, containerization um, changes everything to, well, to a certain extent. Um, so let's use an anal uh, analogy here. So container design is, is much like designing a new car. So if you think about this a little bit more than, well, if in the car manufacturing, engineers design and use internal and external components. If you compare that to a, a, a container environment, that would be your, um, uh, your Docker from, uh, your Docker from statement. Then the production assembles uh, components into a vehicle, uh, that will be your Docker build. Vehicle safety and assembly uh, tests ensure compliance. Uh, so basically testing, QA, QA in your, your uh, uh, containers just to make sure that they're uh, delivering uh, what, you're, what you expect them to do. Delivery occurs using trusted carriers to dealerships. That would be your Docker push, for example, the Docker hub. Uh, vehicle deployment occurs at time of purchase. That, that's when someone does a, does a Docker pull of that, of that image. And repair occurs using validated components. That would be patching your, your images and rebuilding them. Uh, around all of this, there's uh, defined governance and, and compliance. So this, this paradigm works, works pretty well for, for uh, car manufacturing. This paradigm works also pretty well for, uh, for uh, uh, co containerization. Um, the key thing is that every, in every stage of this whole process, you need to question, uh, question everything uh, and evaluate trust. So if you look at the container side of things, then you should be asking yourself things like, okay, where does your base, base image co actually come from? Uh, who owns that? Uh, do you know what's in, uh, in there? Is that maybe uh, uh, um, a vulnerable version of, of op OpenSSL in there? Uh, what is the health of that base image? Uh, so if you f uh, go, for example, go on Docker Hub, then uh, you can see for each layer which vulnerabilities may, uh, are, are hiding in there. Uh, other registries uh, do similar things, so you can consume that health information to, to, uh, to, to determine if you should be consuming or not. Um, Obviously, the Docker commands don't really have a mechanism to, to uh, make these choices uh, while, you're, while you're consuming, but so this typically remains a design time decision. Um, if you're updating at build time, from what cache are you doing, the, uh, doing, this, uh, doing that? Uh, and actually, I have, a, have an example of, of how this can go wrong if, if you're not careful in, in the next, next couple of slides. Um, do you trust your build servers? Who controls them? Who has access to them? Can they be compromised? Is there any way for a foreign container uh, to be started in your environment and you not knowing? So basically outside the, the, uh, the control of the, co the orchestration layer. Um, who has rights to modify container images? What happens if the base, base image registry goes away? What happens if a base image tag goes away? <coughs> what happens if an update mirror goes down? Um, if a, disc a security disclosure happens, what is the process to, de to determine impact? and how are images being updated and deployed in the face of new security disclosures. So these are just examples of questions you should be asking when you think about the whole process of, of containerization, just to make sure that you uh, um, deliver um, as securely as possible. So here's an example of, a, of a, an output of, of a Docker history uh, command. So this basically shows all the steps that were taken to build a specific uh, container image. So we can see that this, this image was built 16 hours ago. Um, files were copied in two days ago. Um, then there's an update minimal seven days ago, and the actual oh sorry about that. The actual um, uh, base image was taken six weeks ago. So if you think about it, is anything that was updated um, um, between now and, and seven days ago will not be taken into account by that update, minim update minimal. 
The same for those files that were copy copied in. If they change in the meantime, they will not be taken into account. So this basically means that um, uh, uh, to prevent these kind of situations, you need to basically build uh, on a build environment that has no meaningful cache for anything that can can uh, can change, right? So in this case, these updates and these and these files. Uh, another example on um, uh, image consistency and pool specifications. So this shows a, a single cluster node. Um, I pull down an image based on this latest tag, uh, right? So every every uh, image has tags. Latest is the default there. Next to that, I can give it uh, uh, specific la uh, labels. So I scale this up to two uh, two replicas based on that uh, on that latest tag again. Then I pull and uh, pull down the same image, but now based on the uh, the 101 tag. Again, scale that to two uh, two replicas. And then I, I again pull down the exact same image, but now based on this full pull spec, so basically the SHA. Again, scale that to two replicas, and we're up and running. Then I remove the 101 uh, uh, <coughs> tag from the registry, and then scale based on that, on that tag in, uh, on this node. This works because that 101 tag is still cached there. However, if I now, now for some reason need to bring, bring this node down, then we're in a bit of a problem because um, the cluster will basically try to, to move everything to the, to, the, to the new node. This works fine for the, uh, the, uh, those, those images that are uh, referenced by their, their full pool spec. But for example, the latest tag may be assigned to a, to a different image version right now. So you may have a different version of the image. And obviously the 101 version cannot be brought back here. So, um, in these kind of situations, you need to uh, need to be aware that um, uh, if you, uh, um, <coughs> you may be getting different results if you don't uh, if you decide not to pull down things by this by their fully qualified pull spec. Um, this is on deployments and trigger uh, deployments and triggers. Um, so this uh, I won't go into much detail here, but basically um, here you can define when when new deployments should take place and uh, what kind of uh, 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 upgrade strategy you're, you're going to apply in this case it's a rolling upgrade um, however it's just if you automatically apply up, uh, updates to to uh, to images uh, updates to packages and, and just roll them out then that may actually be a bit of a tricky situation because if you look at Apache struts then over the last year we actually saw that there are a couple of versions that if you would uh, if you would upgrade to a, to a, the, the the newer most logical uh, newer version, you would fi actually find yourself in a situation where the number of vulnerabilities actually increased. So doing this automatically may not be this, uh, be, be the, the best strategy here. And uh, that's where information flow comes in. So inf information flow actually is key to to uh, to, to pr production security. So I'm going to assume that everyone is familiar with the, uh, the National Vulnerability Database. So in there you find CVs, basic, basically records of uh, uh, describing vulnerabilities that have been uh, published. Um, <coughs> and in here I have a description of a, a vulnerability uh, uh, reported on, on Apache Struts. So here it says the REST plugin <coughs> in Apache Struts 212 through 23x before 2334 and 25x before 2.5.13 uses an extreme handler with, in, with an instance of extreme for deserialization without any type of filtering, which can lead to remote code execution which, when deserializing XML payloads. Um, so this clearly um, is targeted towards, well, uh, this is basically a security speak or at least uh, someone with intimate knowledge of, 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 of Apache struts in this case. Um, and Honestly, there's not much, uh, not, not much information that helps you properly analyze this, this vulnerability in your, in your own environment. If you look at um, uh, one of our, yeah, this is, this is a BDSA, a Black Hat Security Advisory. So this is actually what, what our uh, research team came, came up with when they took a closer look at this. Um, so first it comes up with a bit of a description of what Apache Struts is all, uh, all about, in case you don't, you, you, you don't know. Um, <clears throat> it tells you exactly which versions are impacted. Uh, also, it says a successful exploitation of the flaw can, uh, could enable a hacker to gain full control of the affected server and letting the attacker infiltrate other systems on the same network. But more interestingly, it also says that there's, there can be a, a problem with back, backward compatibility here. So uh, it is possible that some REST actions stop working because of applied default uh, restrictions uh, on available classes. In such case, please investigate new, the new interfaces uh, that were introduced to allow defined class restrictions per action. 
So upgrading to the latest version or the indicated versions may not um, uh, bring you in the situation uh, um, uh, of, a, of a properly functioning application. So having this kind of information at your fingertips is, is crucial towards uh, being efficient about doing impact analysis and, and, and finding out what remediation actions you could take. Um, <coughs> to give an example of that, upgrading to a later version may not be, uh, be, be feasible. That may break dependencies or there may some, be some other problems. So uh, it would also be nice if you could have some, some workarounds. So in this case, we actually have three. Uh, so, for example, disabling, uh, disable handling XML pages and requests to such, such pages. There are two more uh, workarounds. So, again, having these, this kind of information at your fingertips next to just saying, okay, just upgrade it to the la latest version and you're good. Um, this gives you options and um, 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 may save you some work where, when you can avoid, avoid an upgrade, actually. Then also things like exploits. Well, uh, so not every vulnerability will have a public exploit. But if, it, if it's an interesting one, then um, yeah, you can bet on it that, that there are some exploits available. <coughs> so um, well, the fact that there are, are, there are exploits available automatically um, it means, means a bit of a higher risk, right? But uh, there's also an advantage to this because you can also use these exploits, which are uh, linked here, um, uh, to find out if your application is really, really exploitable based on the vulnerabilities, uh, based on this specific vulnerability. So again, having this kind of information available is, is key to, to, be efficient, to, to be efficient about uh, uh, impact analysis and, and, uh, and remediation actions. Web services, they, well, they introduce new kind, kind of risk profiles. Um, so um, there are examples when, when specific services uh, uh, were discontinued or um, uh, you may be using specific versions of, 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 of a uh, public API. Uh, what does the life cycle of that API, API look like? How are how long are old versions maintained, things like that. Um, what kind of data is being passed back and forth? Is that okay from a, uh, um, uh, <coughs> from a um, uh, confidentiality perspective? Um, is there a possibility for man-in-the-middle attacks? All these kind of things you need to think about when you're consuming APIs. So basically you need to know what you're consuming and, and um, um, make sure that you keep an eye on that. And uh, So this is a, a new class of, of, of uh, yeah, of problems, I would say, to, that's, or potential risk that you need to need to look at. Well, there's some good news in this. Uh, if you think back about the number of vulnerabilities that were uh, uh, reported every year, that that roughly translates to about 50 per year. Now, with <coughs> with threat agents continuously monitoring networks um, and and using uh, uh, all sorts of uh, tools in in the, in the portfolio to uh, well, basically, success is becoming a, becoming a numbers game. So you don't, don't need any knowledge of, of your target, whether that's a local sports club or um, maybe a global, a global company. No knowledge whatsoever is needed. Um, and um, well, as soon as you have some level of success, you can use multiple attack factors to, to go broader in the organization. So typically, infiltration occurs uh, through at least one, one vector. And once you're in, um, then typically the, the, the goal uh, of these attackers would be to create beach hats from where, from where they can move around in the organization, <coughs> and uh, by using exploit, uh, uh, um, by using uh, um, uh, latent vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, dictionary attacks, uh, things like that, and all all with the goal to find out if there is any value to be to be had, right? So whether it's being sales databases or credit card information, patient information, things like that. And if you think about mitigation uh, options here, <coughs> then at a, at a high level, you have basically have two. So what most people, have actually, uh, uh, basically everyone is doing, is uh, finding out, okay, how do I prevent attacks from the outside world that are coming from the outside world? What not necessarily everyone is doing is um, looking at, at attacks coming from, for example, developer works, uh, workstations. Um, so the key thing there is, is knowing what your application landscape lo looks like. So knowing about your software composition. Um, and once you know what, 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 what components are being used, what so, uh, uh, you're in a position to, uh, to properly do, do an impact analysis. And if you think about those 50 vulnerabilities a day that are published, then if you know what you're using, then you may not be, be uh, needing to deal with all, f all 50, but maybe two or three or something like that. And that would, that, actually, that actually makes, a, makes for a far more manageable uh, situation. 
So if we zoom in a little bit on the Equifax uh, uh, story. So the bug in, 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 uh, in, in Struts was introduced back in, in August 2012 um, by introducing five lines of code that uh, actually basically created uh, an error message. <coughs> um, this became part of Struts 2.3 uh, in November 2012. Uh, in May 2016, this was transformed into Struts 2.5. And then in, on March 6th, 2017, um, patches were available for this, uh, for this vulnerability. On March 7th of that same year, uh, this uh, disclosure was published. And about a week later, the NVD details were available in, in a well, somewhat usable form. Um, this was actually relatively quick for the, uh, the NVD, uh, for the, 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 the vulnerabilities that are published and made the IT headlines. They're typically relatively quick, but on average, we see that this lags behind about two to three weeks. <coughs> um, then Richard F. Smith, when he prepared his testimony for the U.S. Congress, um, he basically stated that um, uh, they did perform scans, uh, but they didn't find vulnerable versions of Apache Struts. And actually, that, that, so we, we don't know exactly what happened, but uh, it's, it's fair to assume that this, uh, the reason they didn't find it is because they did, they did periodic scans, not co no, no continuous monitoring. So a scenario that could, could very likely have happened here is that they, they did scans, found no vulnerable versions of Apache Struts, and then found that their applications, well, one of their applications actually uh, had, a, had a defect, decided to roll back to an earlier version that didn't have that defect, uh, but thereby also reversing, um, uh, re reversing to an older version of Apache Struts, which did have that, that, uh, that vulnerability. Like I said, it's, it's, um, it's not, not sure that that's exactly what, what happened, but it's, uh, given that the, it, it certainly seems that they, they were doing periodic scans and not continuous monitoring, and then you may find yourself in, in a situation like this. <clears throat> Then on May 13, uh, hacks were successful, and the hacks were actually discovered in July, uh, on July 29th. So if you think about this a bit more than uh, that, that first part, uh, so basically uh, from the moment the, the bug was introduced to uh, patches being available, roughly five years, four and a half, um, y there's not much you can do about that, um, unless you have a dedicated team of researchers that want to focus on, on finding security vulnerabilities, but not a whole lot of companies are actually doing that. Um, then a uh, moment from disclosure to published to uh, the NVD details being available seven days, knowing that this vulnerability was uh, heavily being uh, abused for, for uh, uh, hacking attacks, uh, attempts globally in the first 48 hours, seven days is quite long, right? If you have to wait for seven days before you can actually do an impact analysis, that doesn't really look like a very, uh, very nice situation. But actually, most alarmingly, if you look at the right side of this slide, it says uh, it took 78 days from uh, the moment the hacks were successful until the hacks were actually discovered. So one of the largest breaches um, uh, that, that we've seen in recent history, the company that, 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 that was responsible for that uh, actually did quite a bit better than that average. So as you remember from the Ponemon uh, uh, report, that says about, uh, about 260 days that it typically takes from um, um, uh, identification of a breach to containment. So actually, Aquifax did a lot better than that. So basically, we don't want to give attackers opportunities. So uh, the, the heartbeat vulnerability predated the Aquifax uh, incident uh, by, by a few years. Uh, so this was, this was obviously a bug in, in OpenSSL. Uh, the showdown report, uh, report in 2017 <coughs> showed us that uh, at that time, so basically three years after Heartbleed was published, uh, almost 200,000 websites globally were still vulnerable to Heartbleed. So obviously there, there's, a, there's a long tail here. Um, a colleague of mine actually redid that same exercise uh, early this year and found that, well, things improved but now we're only uh, looking at 137,000 uh, vulnerable websites based on, on the Heartbleed bug. <coughs> and honestly, that's not, not, that's not really surprising because if you look, if, if, you just, uh, if we just stick with the OpenSSL example here, so, so this is the core uh, OpenSSL uh, repository. Uh, there are 19 branches there, 280 releases. Uh, there are 3,000 different forks, at least tracked here. <coughs> 
So keeping track of all of those and, and finding out um, what, uh, uh, how to deal with those, if, there, if all these forks are properly patching things, uh, uh, and things like that. Um, so that becomes a pretty complex scenario to, to, to work with, right? And here's where a solution like, uh, well, an SCA solution can, can come in. So uh, SCA, software composition analysis, well, BlackDuck is one of those, or obviously uh, quite a few other vendors out, out there. Um, I don't want to be talking to <laughs> too much about how, how, how BlackDuck can, uh, can help you. If you want to talk about that, we're still around for, uh, uh, for some time on the, uh, at our booth uh, uh, downstairs. But what I do want to share with you is what, what we think, what, what we feel should be requirements you should be looking into uh, when you lo start looking into an SCA solution. So first of all, I mentioned this a couple of times, multi-factor discovery. So making sure that you do not only rely on things that are declared, either through package manager or, even, or maybe even manually by developers. We still see, see that a lot. Uh, but actually uh, uh, look for a solution that actually tries to find all open source. So al also the things that are pulled in directly, put in your configuration management system, maybe changed, stripped down to the bare minimum of what, what is needed. Finding those components is not a trivial task. So look for a solution that does multi-factor discovery. You also want to be looking into a uh, solution that has a comprehensive knowledge base. Obviously, there's a lot of open source out there, lots of different sources. Um, we track about 15,000, um, and GitHub, for example, is just, just one of those. Um, enhanced vulnerability data. I already mentioned that the NVD is typically not very quick with, with uh, reporting new vulnerabilities. Uh, also, the scope is not as big as it, as, as it, as it can be. Um, so, um, yeah, you, you, you want to be looking for a solution that can actually give you that same day impact analysis, G give you those notifications the very same day, uh, give, give, you, give you those notifications of uh, vulnerable components um, the very same day those, those vulnerabilities are reported. And obviously the solution needs to be, uh, um, be able to, to deal with the whole life cycle. So helping developers pick and choose the right components, <clears throat> making sure that they pick the right uh, uh, the, the secure versions of those components, um, perform scans, for example, from your CI-CD environment, or maybe in your binary repository, if, if, that's, if that's appropriate, uh, and pr preferably all the way through, through production by, for example, automatically scanning your container images that get deployed, and, and making sure that you have an understanding of, uh, of what, uh, what vulnerabilities may be hiding, hiding in there. So that's, that's what I had to share with you, with, with you today. So yeah, my name is Ron de Jong. I'm with Black Duck. We have a booth downstairs. So if you want to uh, take, uh, talk a bit more about this, uh, it, uh, then please, please visit us. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. No one? OK, then I uh, want to thank you for your attention.